and welcome to a very special EWTN bookmark. I'm Doug Keck, your host, and through the magic of television, we'll be joined by our good friend and author, Marcus Grodi, talking about his new book, Pillar and Bulwark, published by the Coming Home Resources. And we go now to Marcus Grodi in the Journey Home studio to talk about his new novel. Hey, Marcus, great to see you. Hello, Doug. It's great to, to join you this way. I'd much rather be sitting right straight in front of you uh, because of our friendship, but I appreciate your willingness to uh, to talk about the books. Right, it's great, and, and it would be nice to have you here on uh, our new set here for EWTN's Bookmark. And obviously, uh, you've been on the program multiple times, so we've talked about a couple of your books. First couple having to do really more specific with the whole conversion process, at least in conversion stories like The Journey's Home, et cetera, right? You right. had two books like that, right? Yes. Yeah, and thoughts for the journey home. Right, and then the other was your, your when you dipped your toe into fiction, into <laughs> writing a novel, and the original one, How Firm a Foundation. Now that actually goes back 10 years now, right? When yeah. this first came out, 2002. That's right. Right, and this is technically the third edition. What is actually different about this edition versus the previous two? Well, actually, technically it's the fourth edition. Oh, it is, okay. Uh, but that's all right. The, you know, the reason I, I wrote the book in the first place <clears throat> was not because I either had a great ambition to be a novelist uh, or thought I was one. It, it came more from a desire to reach my father, who How only so? read How fiction. So? He, he could not understand why Marilyn and I would resign from the ministry to become Catholics. Mm -hmm. And I would give him all those great nonfiction books that you feature every week on on bookmark. So the Scott Hahn and the Carl Keating and the Steve Ray and the Pat Madrid kind of material. Exactly. Right, or right. the catechism. And my right, father okay, would say, right. great, thanks for the gift. And he'd put them on the shelf right. because his primary uh, interest was in fiction. Okay. And he would read a, a book of fiction one a day all his life. He loved fiction. So the idea was, okay, dad, I'm going to slip you a fiction, a, a novel mm -hmm. to help explain the conversion process. So that's how the idea began 10 years ago. That's how, how Firma Foundation came about. And in, in, in How Firma Foundation, it was not autobiographical, but yet on the other hand, everything in the story right. can be linked to a, a real person in their journey. Right, and obviously you make the point at the end of both of these books to make it clear to people that you're not the main character and clearly above all else that, uh, that Marilyn, your wife, is not the model Thanks. for the the female character as exactly. well. Exactly, I've got to make that point perfectly clear. <laughs> right, so that people uh, don't uh, misinterpret everything. But like you said, obviously, these are all experiences that have uh, things that you've dealt with over the years, either in your own personal life or because, maybe in a lot of ways, because of your experiences uh, at the Coming Home Network, right? Right, right. He, you know, being intimately involved with men and women on the journey, hearing their struggles, uh, also, as the privilege you've given me on EWTN to do Journeys Home, we hear their stories. But what I wanted to accomplish in fiction is I'm able to ex get deeper into their lives in a way that they would not reveal here on the Journey Home set. Or even in, when you read a conversion story like in the Coming Home Network newsletter, mm -hmm. you might hear the intellectual reasons why someone's drawn to the Catholic Church or the experiences they read a a book or, or watched an EWTN program, but in fiction, I'm, a lot, I'm able to help the reader experience the psychological, the relational, mm -hmm. the emotional aspects of, of sometimes the visceral uh, reaction to the discovery of truth. Sometimes we think, wow, you know, these people believe that Catholics worship Mary and all of a sudden mm -hmm. they learn the truth and now they realize Catholics don't worship Mary. On an intellectual level, that's factual. Right. What's going on inside? Mm -hmm. uh, if they've had, because of experiences and upbringing, an anger right. against the Catholic Church, right. a visceral rejection of the Catholic Church. So now, intellectually, they might know the truth right. of the Church, but going on inside is a reaction to, I don't want, I don't want this truth. Right. I don't want to go there. Right. And sometimes that causes upheaval in vocation, occupation, relationships, marriage, even the interpersonal understanding of who a person is might cause them to go through a great crisis. And in many ways, that's what the second book in this series right, is Right, that's Pillar and Bulwark. And I was thinking, because I, I guess the lead character is Scott and Diane Turner, and I believe it's Scott Turner in, in the 
in pillar and bulwark. Yep. I was thinking about while you were talking because he's he was a, he's a pro football player who becomes a minister, right? Right. And uh, I was thinking about what you were saying too. That that whole idea of of sometimes when we watch professional athletes, we expect them to perform like machines. Yeah. And likewise, I was thinking of people who are converts. They come to the truth. And we expect, well, you've come to the truth, and now you know what to do without taking into account, as you're indicating and you demonstrate in both of these books, there's, this is a person with real feelings and real emotions and real relationships, right? Yes. And a real life they have to live out. And these decisions they make, albeit them the best thing maybe for their soul, ultimately, are very, very difficult. Right. And... St. Paul said in his first letter to Timothy in chapter 3, when he was talking about people who were <clears throat> drawn to be a bishop, he warned, don't ordain a newly converted person mm -hmm. because they might get puffed up <laughs> by pride of the devil. And the point behind that is conversion is a long going process. Uh -huh. And just because a person comes into the church doesn't mean all of a sudden they understand the church they understand all the reasoning. They understand the praxis, the devotions. I've been a Catholic now almost 20 years, and I'm still learning to understand what I believe intellectually. Right. But there's a lot of other issues. The other reason that I wanted to write Pillar and Bulwark was to demonstrate that conversion is never an individual experience. Mm -hmm. It has an effect on marriage, on our children, on our friends, on our parishioners. Like when you throw a stone in a lake, mm -hmm. you see the ripples. There's a ripple effect of conversion. And you hear the story in the journey home, you hear about that one person's journey. You don't often hear what happened to his wife, right. to his children, to his friends, to his parishioners. I've tried to demonstrate that ripple effect of the uh, one person's discovery of truth and how it affects the people around them. Right, and also sometimes even like on a journey home experience, just like in the, in the world of celebrity, Somebody does something, you hear the story at the time when it's happening, and many times very positive, et cetera. And sometimes if you check back five years later, you realize that there, there's been a lot of issues in between and a lot of things that these people are dealing with. And yeah, you've got to, to be able to do it for the long haul, right? Yeah, and sometimes a, a convert is nervous to express that we, I've arrived. Mm -hmm. Because it is a, not that they're going to necessarily give up on the Catholic Church, but you're still dealing with issues you find in the church. Mm -hmm. Scandal. Right. Uh, you know, people in the church that aren't living their faith. Right. They can become very discouraged. And uh, that's why I believe that the number one virtue that every convert needs to learn is humility. Right. It's very important to learn. The, the reception, like when you look at the characters in the story, in fact, Rafe and Maeda in the story are, are, I think, my favorite characters in the story. And Rafe was a, a flaming fundamentalist, mm -hmm. end of the world, anti-Catholic, vehemently anti-Catholic believer. Completely sincere in a love for Jesus Christ, wanting to serve the Lord in whatever way, but he had as a part of the makeup of his faith this, this um, hatred for the Catholic Church. And how he comes through that, and in many ways what opened the chink in the wall of his life was the love of a woman, mm -hmm. an acceptance of him. It didn't make him Catholic, but it set him on the journey. And when people, they hope the trajectory is going to be straight into the church and beyond and to be a faithful representative of the church, but all of us right. are sinners. Mm -hmm. And we can all fail, every one of us. And we've all of us seen celebrities who have been up in front and all of a sudden for one reason or another they disappear because their lives fall apart. Well, we right. should never stand in judgment of anyone. Mm -hmm. It could be us. You know, every one of us is called to live out our faith. And, mm -hmm. and I found that in the, the genre of fiction, we can d see that in the lives of people where mm -hmm. in a biography or an autobiography, a person might want to kind of hide some of that stuff because they want to come out looking mm -hmm. like a saint. Right. I love that name, Rafe. Uh, you know, it's interesting, too, because uh, he's tied into a ca character named Walter, right? Right. Walter Horst? Yep. Now, he was in the, the first book, right? Yeah. Okay, and there's a connection there on b both of them being kind of fundamentalists, right? 
And yeah, they were the best buddies, and uh, they represented people that I've known all my life who are very sincere. They love Jesus Christ. There's no question there. There's no question there. But there's the danger of sola scriptura, which is you can take a few verses and through your enthusiasm and sincerity, right. interpret it to mean whatever you want it to mean. And especially if you're like approaching a part of the book was the approaching of, uh, you know, Y2K. So in right. other words, you're, you're approaching a time period when you really believe everything's going to come together, all the prophecies of Scripture. And, of course, the fundamentalists always saw the Pope and the church as the Antichrist. And so these guys are caught up in that. And how did they come out of it? Right. How do you get people out of that thinking? Right. It's interesting, too, because, I mean, obviously, uh, though it's, uh, you know, 12 years in the past, and but, you know, a lot of us obviously... Uh, who are sitting here in our homes today watching this program certainly were around when when uh, it became January 1st 2000 right. and we went through <laughs> a lot of the you know the whole Y2K we got to fix the computer bug what's going to happen and and it's interesting because you kind of tie it into reference in the same section kind of talking about Joseph Smith and William Miller and the Jehovah Witnesses and and the rapture uh, you know the 88 reasons it'll happen in 88 and yeah. even in uh, last year you still had Harold Camping uh, talking about the the world coming to an end, and, and up until this point in time, no one's been correct about that. And right. one of the things that's, that's interesting, too, is that a lot of Catholics don't realize, I guess in many ways, that these people that you're talking about, because I know you kind of read about a character like a, a Walter in the first one, and let's say a Rafe in this one, and think, well, that's really an exaggeration. That's, you know, people don't really think like that anymore, do they? Yeah, well, I know people, not only... Do I know people that think that way? I used to. I was never in that camp, but I had friends at seminary that were so in that camp. There are anti-Catholic apologists mm -hmm. that are very much in that camp. If you go on the internet, there are a couple websites that are completely against me. Mm -hmm. uh, really? In the Journey Home Program. Okay. And because they believe that the Catholic Church and the Pope and Catholics are, are lost to Satan. Um, in fact, I, I one time encountered one of these guys that was attacking me on the internet, saying things about me on the internet, and I emailed him and said, look, you, you say you're a Christian and that you believe in Scripture, like the guys in these books. But Jesus said that if you've got a complaint against a brother, you go to the brother first. Mm -hmm. Don't go to the public. He wrote back, you're not my brother. I see. Okay. Because you're a Catholic. So because you're like a Judas goat or something, yeah. right? Okay. So well, let me ask you, and, and I'm sure people out there who have either read the first book would like to know, and certainly people who are considering Pillar and Bulwark are wondering the same thing. There's a connection, obviously, between the two books. And what, now, first of all, the main characters, the couple from the first book, How Firm a Foundation, are also in Pillar and Bulwark. And what, it's about a year later in time, is that right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so one of the questions people would obviously ask is, do I need to read How Firm a Foundation before I can read Pillar and Bulwark? Well, I've certainly tried to do everything I can to make the second book stand on its own. Okay. And I think okay. that's very important. Uh, it's obviously important because people pick up a sequel and they haven't read the first, they're lost. So I've tried to make the second. I would encourage reading both together, um, primarily because what I'm trying to do in the stories is to give a, um, to show uh, the conversion process in the lives of people what's happening outside and inside. So, especially with Stephen and Sarah, mm -hmm. who, who crossed, they're the, the, the kind of key flow of the two books. Right, they're the couple from the original book, really, right. that you follow through. Now, right. Scott and Diane were friends. They showed up in the first book, but they become the focus in the second book. Right, because they're the actually for, more like the lead characters, in a sense. Yeah, the reason book. for the second book, in many ways, was because the first book, the main characters didn't become Catholic. But the discovery of the Catholic Church brought a complete upheaval in ministry and in marriage. Mm -hmm. And so people were asking, what happened to Stephen? So the second book is based on the idea of their friends trying to find out, because Stephen has disappeared. And so they're trying to find out what happened to what Stephen. Do you mean, what do you mean for somebody, what do you mean disappeared? Like he's got Well, he resigned or? from his pastorate. Okay, so they just know where he is? is... They, they, he really has kind of disappeared. In other words, he struggling with what to do with his life now after he's resigned from the ministry he sees himself differently he's struggling with whether he should make the final step into the catholic church because frankly it has caused a total upheaval in his marriage and family mm -hmm. and 
which happens we, in our work with clergy. It, it definitely happens to people. They often cause a breakup in marriage and family, at least temporarily, if not permanently. Right. And so he's experiencing a great upheaval of his understanding of who he is, because his understanding before was, I'm a minister, I'm a minister of God, that's my life. That's your identity. In a My lot identity. Of ways, right, right, he's right. cast all that aside. He's not no longer a Protestant. He's not yet a Catholic. What am I going to do? His marriage is broken up. So he's trying to move on. And what happens at the beginning of Pillar and Bulwark is that he's basically, he's, you could say on, a, on a, a light way, he's on retreat, but basically he's just taken off mm -hmm. to try and get his head together, to get away from the distractions. So he's gone. So did Nobody you write knows this, where he's gone. So did you write this with a little bit of a mystery in it to to make the book that much more interesting? Was that a, exactly a direct my attempt? goal? Again, when I began to write to my father, I knew he liked um, Grisham books, okay. uh, the mystery books, uh, spy novels, mm -hmm. Stephen King, um, and recognizing that many modern readers don't have the the, the reading patience that old, you know, when people read Dickens. Mm -hmm. So my goal, that's why Walter and, and Rafe are introduced into the story to give an edge, uh, an interest to draw people, but also to see how the conversion prop, uh, process affects not only ministers, but right. their wives, their children, their parishioners right. from all different backgrounds. Well, sometimes also characters like that can be used as foils to demonstrate points you want to make, right? Exactly. Right, okay. Now, because of the dialogue, I've, I've worked really hard to not m allow the novels to be mere um, apologetic mm -hmm. texts. I didn't want that. Um, I wanted people to hear an mm -hmm. authentic conversation between two people talking about a topic. Now, not, in, the, in this book, Pillar and Bulwark, is it written from... The perspective of Scott, I mean, is this Scott telling us this story? Is it you telling the story about Scott and Stephen and their wives? Actually, what I did with Pillar and Bulwark is something a little different than the average novel. I use two different kinds of perspectives. Okay. Actually, a part of the book is as if, is Scott writing in his own journal? Right, that's what I was wondering, because that's, yeah. that's kind of the feel you get, for, yeah, at least one, from part, part of the Part of the book. book is you're hearing Scott, first person, tell what happened to him during this year. Mm -hmm. But intermixed in that is the narrator telling now what's happening to Rafe and to Maeda and to Stephen and Father Bork and all these other people. You're seeing it happen. And then once in a while introduced into the story is Scott writing into his journal. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, that's a little different than how firm a foundation yeah. then. Right? Yeah. Okay. Well, let me ask you too. Now, uh, just talking about the whole writing process. Now, how firm a foundation the story, how long did it take you to develop the idea, the outline of a story like this, let alone start writing and putting it together, understanding that maybe you learned a love of fiction because you know your dad liked to read fiction growing up. Uh, was it an interest for you as well? Or was yeah. it purely something that was pragmatic in the sense, this is the book, the only way I'm going to get my father to read a book is to write fiction? Well, I have to admit that reading is probably my number one hobby. Okay. I've always loved reading, and I've, I've always been moved by fiction. And, the, you know, fiction and nonfiction can reach into people's minds and hearts in a different way. Mm -hmm. In general, I see nonfiction as more intellectual, reaching our intellect, whereas often fiction, in my view, can go deeper into us. Mm -hmm. I hate to use the word heart because in our culture we think of heart as emotions. Well, that's part of it. But I believe that fiction can grab us. Uh, I have to admit, one of my favorite novels of all time is To Kill a Mockingbird. Right. right. And uh, which written in your neck of the woods down there. Sure, right, right. And I think it's a 50 year anniversary. But the beauty of that book was that she did not preach when she wrote that book. Mm -hmm. But she helped you experience the evils of bigotry and racism and prejudice without preaching it. Right. You experienced it. And that's, of course, what I would hope to do in these books is ex help you experience right. the journey. How Firm a Foundation was written over a period of two, three years. Same thing with Pillar and Bulwark. Uh, they both went through a lot of changes and edits because what I find in fiction mm -hmm. is that it's hard to describe. And I've heard Raymond talk about this on his program, that when you're writing fiction, 
It's not that you're making up this stuff. Mm -hmm. It's as if intellectually you're seeing it happen. Right, right. You know, Rafe and Maeda are real people in my mind. Well, let me ask you that. So when you do that and the characters start to develop, do you follow where the characters lead you or do you force the characters to follow your storyline? A lot of things happened in both books that I never anticipated. Mm -hmm. In fact, an example of this was now in the first book when Stephen is shot, it wasn't directly um, fact by fact related to an incident that I know of, but yeah. okay. it was based on the fact that I know a convert who was literally shot in the neck. Right, right. Okay, so it's based on reality. So that became a part of that story because of what I saw happen. But mm -hmm. as I'm telling the story, I'm starting to realize that, for example, there's one place in this where Stephen is driving on a highway at the same time that his son is driving on a highway. And as I'm writing the story, I'm realizing that they pass each other. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that, but I'm seeing that happen. Right, so all right. of a sudden that becomes a part of the story. Mm -hmm. Or and trying to ma imagine what would they say? You know, how would they react to that? How would this person react? How would this person? They become real people. And, and, uh, and it, when someone says you need to change something in this character, that becomes difficult. Mm -hmm. Now, who would, let me ask you that, too, because obviously you're putting this book together and, uh, you know, you put some other books together, but obviously you, you haven't spent your life writing novels, as we all know, and we're very happy because you're here on doing the Journey Home program for EWTN and your other fine work with the Coming Home Network. So uh, is it a collaborative effort? I mean, is, is there like a co-author or an editor? Uh, how does it actually work? And, and what's the interest? I have there? an editor. Um, in fact, that's why we did this new edition of How Firm, because okay. we, we were able to find a very fine fiction editor. And it, there's no as reason, uh, no way in which she was like a, a, uh, uh, a co-author, because she didn't change the plot or the characters. What she would help me do, besides making sure my verb tenses were right, okay. <laughs> uh, finding words that shouldn't fit. But she helped me see when the stories mm -hmm like in verse two, excuse me, chapter two, a person's age is 35, and then all of a sudden in, in, in another chapter, I'm having him at age 33. Mm -hmm. So there's the continuity of the story. Where are they at? Do the things fit? That's what a good editor can do, as well as correcting grammar. But uh, suggestions on actually changing character was tough, and right. I resisted that unless mm -hmm. it made all the sense in the world. And sometimes the editor said, you know, I don't think your character would have done this. Right. And then as I relook at it, I realize you're exactly right. right. Uh, and you he, think that's the conflict where you, you have an idea or you, where you want something to go. The other person is basically following the storyline as it's revealed by the character. And then in some ways they have a, a little distance that allows them to, to have that point of view, right? Yeah, for example, the editor at one point, I can't remember specifically, but pointed out something that she did not think that Rafe would have reacted in a certain way to what happened. And so I took a step back and I looked at it and I realized that she was exactly right. Mm -hmm. Rafe wouldn't have reacted or said a certain thing. Right. So uh, it wasn't really changing the character. It was the editor helping me see the very character that had come alive in the fiction. Right. Uh, that's why I love fiction uh, okay. and, and the power of that. Well, let me let me ask you. I remember going back to when uh, you wrote the How Firm a Foundation and discussions we had on the show and uh, you know on the side, the idea of also this being a book, and I'm assuming Pillar and Bullock fits into this as well. The kind of book you can give to somebody who's not Catholic, right? Uh, who might be thinking about the church or maybe just have some questions, and in, and in some ways, is it a continuation of, in a sense a gentle catechesis? Yeah. Uh, sometimes we use the word stealth evangelization, but that's, that's way too strong. We've made the books. You can't tell they're Catholic by looking at them. I do believe one of the main reasons our non-Catholic brothers and sisters do not read Catholic things is because sometimes at the onset they're too Catholic mm -hmm. and they can't get beyond that. So I didn't want any of those barriers to prevent people from getting into the story. Right. I also wanted to make sure that when I'm writing and describing non-Catholics, that I'm not being, I'm not caricaturing them, I'm not raising a, a straw man. I wanted any reader to say, "Yeah, that's true," or "That's the way life happens," or "No, and I see the or truth." Or I've met somebody like that, right? 
Yeah, right. Well, I noticed also, you talk about the first book in relation to your dad. I noticed the second book. Is that dedicated to your mother then? That's right. <laughs> Very much so. I mean, there's nothing in the book that directly relates to my mother, but she's, all, of course, always been a great inspiration to me uh, in many ways that I, I don't even realize. I right. think, if anything, my love for music and for literature and for truth in many ways came from her and still does. And she's a great inspiration for that. She came into the church, uh, I can't remember, about four or five years ago after my father passed. Right. Well, I have to say that you've been a great inspiration to many of us here at EWTN as well as the audience who've been following you on the journey well, home. I appreciate and, that. Yeah, thanks thanks for your, your great work in the Coming Home Network and for your fine writing ability as well. Marcus Grodi, thank you so much. Marcus. Thank for you your know. new book, Pillar and Bulwark, and look for also the new edition of How Firm a Foundation, both of them uh, published by the Coming Home Resources, both available through the EWTN Religious Catalog. Thank you for joining us for this special edition of EWTN Bookmark.